Hi everyone, this is Greg Stitt from the University of Florida, and in this presentation I'm going to be giving you an overview of intermediate fabrics, which are virtual architectures for mainstream reconfigurable computing. So there have been numerous previous studies that have shown that reconfigurable computing devices, such as FPGAs, have significant performance and energy advantages over other devices like CPUs and GPUs for important applications and important domains. However, despite these advantages, FPGAs have seen limited usage due to application design productivity that can be an order of magnitude worse than other devices. In fact, in a recent conversation I had with one of the major FPGA vendors, they expressed a serious concern that they were now starting to lose customers to GPUs even for applications where FPGAs were kind of the big winner in terms of performance or energy. So people are basically starting to move away from FPGAs simply because it's very hard to create applications for these devices. And this is unfortunate because ideally any designer should have the potential to benefit from the advantages provided by FPGAs. So let's take a look at some of the main productivity bottlenecks that are causing these problems. So first, it's still common for FPGA designers to use register transfer level code, which is extremely difficult compared to more mainstream programming techniques such as you know, C code or Java. Alternatively, there's been a lot of research into high level synthesis to enable high level code to be compiled or synthesized to an FPGA but unfortunately, the current state of the art has significant limitations which prevent it from being used by more mainstream designers. Fortunately, there's a huge amount of research going on that is trying to address these issues with high-level synthesis to make FPGA design more accessible to kind of mainstream non-expert designers. However, even with perfect synthesis tools, there's still problems with current FPGA tool flows that would prevent more widespread usage of FPGAs. The first of those problems is that FPGA compile times are extremely long and they're getting increasingly long. So it's not uncommon for compilation to take you know, hours. It's very common to take hours. In some cases it can take days. I recently just worked with applications that took two and a half days every time you had to compile. So this is a major productivity bottleneck. And it's not just an annoyance, it actually prevents mainstream design methodologies that rely on rapid compilation. So if you think about how most people write software, if there's a slight bug in their code, you know, they add a printf, they compile, they run it, they see what happens. That's not possible if compilation takes two days. So because of these compilation times, designers are forced into using methodologies that conflict with mainstream practices. In addition, some of the current research on high-level synthesis from languages like OpenCL almost requires fast compilation because a mainstream designer isn't going to switch to an FPGA from a GPU if they have to deal with you know, compilation times of two days. And actually, to be fully OpenCL compliant, you actually need fast compilation because OpenCL uses a runtime compilation model where you don't actually compile the code until you reach the OpenCL code at runtime. And obviously that's not going to work if you have to stall your application for hours or days just to compile. The second unaddressed problem with FPGA tool flows is that there's very limited application portability. So first of all, at the level of the FPGA bit file, there's actually no portability. This isn't a real big deal because in the best case, you can recompile your application for a different device. It may take several days, but it's not a major productivity bottleneck. So the real problem is that the application code itself tends to be either device specific or highly specialized to a particular device. And this has caused significant problems because it is limited design reuse that's common on other devices. So there's basically no widespread libraries for FPGAs where people can reuse common functionality. It's not uncommon when working with an FPGA application to have to re-implement common functionality over and over again for different applications and different devices, and this is a significant productivity bottleneck. So to potentially solve these problems, we've introduced a technology called intermediate fabrics, 
which are basically virtual reconfigurable architectures implemented on top of a physical FPGA. The term intermediate basically refers to the fact that the fabric is an intermediate layer lying between the application itself and the underlying FPGA. As I'll show later in the presentation, intermediate fabrics enable near instant FPGA compilation that is currently about 700 times faster than commercial tools. In addition, intermediate fabrics also enable application portability across potentially any FPGA which is important because it encourages more widespread design reuse. And there's also various other advantages that I'll talk about throughout the presentation. So before I get into the details of how intermediate fabrics work, I first want to step through a comparison of traditional FPGA tool flows with the intermediate fabric tool flow. So traditionally, you start off with some specification of your application, either in high level code or register transfer level code. I'm going to use a signal processing example where we have FFTs and multiplies, and I'm going to assume that these are floating point operations. So what you would do in the traditional flow is take this application, pass it to a synthesis tool, which would then decompose the several coarse grained operations into tens of thousands of fine grained lookup tables. Those lookup tables would then be passed to placement and routing which ends up taking a very long amount of time because it has to deal with these tens of thousands of fine-grained resources. Once placement and routing finally, finally finishes, it creates a bit file for the FPGA, which again is not portable. Um, and likewise, the specification of the application itself likely has limited portability because it tends to be either specific to a particular FPGA or highly specialized to a particular FPGA. Okay, so now let's compare this to the intermediate fabric tool flow. So again, we're gonna start with the same circuit and we're gonna pass it through synthesis and placement and routing. But the difference now is that instead of directly targeting the FPGA, we're going to choose some appropriate virtual fabric um, that corresponds to kind of the level of granularity required by the circuit. So there's various ways of doing this that I'll talk about, but the way I've illustrated it here is that we have some library of fabrics and we would choose one that has the resources that we need. And so now when we do synthesis and placement and routing, instead of decomposing the circuit into tens of thousands of lookup tables, here we only have to place and route the several coarse grained operations, which enables very fast compilation. So you might be thinking this isn't really anything new because there's been numerous studies that have introduced coarse-grained reconfigurable architectures. An intermediate fabric is a coarse-grained reconfigurable architecture, but what makes it different is that it's a virtual architecture or a virtual device implemented on top of a physical commercial off-the-shelf FPGA. So what it basically achieves is it combines the advantages of coarse-grained reconfigurable architectures with the flexibility advantages and the low cost advantages of commercial off-the-shelf FPGAs. So another important advantage is that because the intermediate fabric is a virtual device, that means you can use the same bit file across multiple physical FPGAs. In other words, once you've implemented an intermediate fabric on a different FPGA, you can configure it with the exact same bit file you used for a different FPGA. And the reason that this is so important is that it basically enables application portability because applications can target the virtual device and a virtual set of resources and use the same bit file regardless of the targeted physical FPGA. Another advantage of intermediate fabrics is that because they're virtual, they can have capabilities that aren't even provided by the underlying physical device. For example, an intermediate fabric can support very fast partial reconfiguration even when the underlying FPGA, for example, an Altera device, does not support partial reconfiguration. Unfortunately, all of these advantages don't come for free. Obviously, there has to be some kind of limitation, and that limitation is that in some situations, intermediate fabrics can have a significant area overhead. So the main research challenge that we're focusing on is how we can minimize that overhead to enable the use of intermediate fabrics in as many usage scenarios as possible.
Okay, so now let's take a more detailed look at the intermediate fabric tool flow. There's actually two distinct parts to the tool flow. The first one shown here is the application design flow, and it turns out that this is basically, you know, what this is what a designer would see. And it turns out that the design flow used for an intermediate fabric is exactly the same as what you would use to target a an actual FPGA. So the difference is, is that you have to have an intermediate fabric at some point during this flow. So the way this works is that when you have, you know, RTL code for the application, either it's automatically generated or you hand write it, that code is then going to be passed off to the IF creation tool flow, which is responsible for figuring out an appropriate fabric to use for your application. And one important thing to remember is that this will typically only happen one time. So in the best case, you will find an, a fabric the first time you compile your application and then reuse that same fabric for subsequent changes. So there's numerous ways that we envision the tool flow selecting an appropriate fabric. At one extreme, we have something called the synthesis model where the tool flow would analyze the requirements of the RTL code and actually synthesize a custom fabric based on those requirements. The advantage to the synthesis model is that because you're creating a highly tuned fabric for the application, it's likely to have low area overhead. The disadvantage is because this custom fabric hasn't been implemented yet on the FPGA, you have to go through one iteration of FPGA place and route. Um, a second option is what we call the library model, and this was actually shown on the previous slide. Um, in, in this situation, the tool flow would analyze the requirements of the RTL code and then search through a library to select an appropriate fabric. The advantage here is that that fabric is instantly available because it's in a library. It can already be pre-implemented on the FPGA. The disadvantage is that the library has to have an appropriate fabric, otherwise the model doesn't work very well. A third option is if you're a designer and you know exactly what you want your fabric to look like, you could also just manually specify the fabric architecture. But regardless of the model that you use, the end result is some fabric description that then gets passed back to the synthesis tool and technology mapping in order to compile your application. So next, the tool flow has to implement the selected fabric on the targeted FPGA. Now, there's two ways of doing this. One is by using what we call soft resources, where the virtual fabric is implemented using RTL code. So in other words, the IF implementation tool would output VHDL that corresponds to the virtual fabric. The tools would then take that VHDL, synthesize it, run, in th run it through place and route for the FPGA, which would output a bit file which corresponds to the selected intermediate fabric. So the advantage of using soft resources are that it can be portable uh, because it's just pure RTL code. Um, and it can also be flexible because you can make the fabric do whatever you want it to do. The disadvantage is that there's going to be overhead because there's going to be resources included in that RTL code that would not exist in a physical device. Another alternative is to use what we call hard resources, where instead of you know, implementing the virtual fabric as RTL code, whenever possible, you directly map the virtual resources onto physical resources provided by the actual FPGA. The major advantage of this is, ha is that it has significantly less overhead than soft resources. The disadvantage is that it's less portable because you're essentially tying the virtual resources to physical resources, and it's also much less flexible for that same reason. So these two resource models don't have to necessarily be mutually exclusive. So we envision intermediate fabrics where parts of the fabric use soft resources and parts of the fabric use hard resources, depending on how much we care about flexibility and overhead in different parts of the fabric. So finally, you end up with an FPGA bit file that corresponds to the intermediate fabric. You would load that bit file onto the FPGA, in which case the FPGA has now implemented the virtual fabric. And then you would follow the application design flow to compile your application into a bit file for the intermediate fabric on top of the FPGA. So now let's start taking a look at some of the details of intermediate fabric architectures. And the first thing to recognize is that because an intermediate fabric is a virtual device, it can potentially implement any possible architecture. 
However, to keep the scope of this study feasible, we've currently limited our analysis to common island style layouts where you have, you know, interconnect consisting of routing tracks and switch boxes and connection boxes. And then laid out among those routing resources, you have what we call computational units. This is analogous to what you know what you would find as a lookup table or a CLB in an FPGA. But because an intermediate fabric can be specialized to a particular application, we use the more generic term computational unit, and then we assume that these you know get specialized to whatever is needed by an application. So if we use the previous examples, you know these computational units or these CUs would have FFTs, they'd have floating point multiplies, adds, they may even have filters, things like that. Another important thing to notice is that unlike FPGAs, which have very fine grain routing resources, a virtual track does not have to be a single wire. In fact, our virtual tracks and intermediate fabrics, they generally have a width that corresponds to the width of operations in the computational units. So if we have floating point operations, we very commonly will use 32-bit virtual tracks in the immediate fabric ar architecture. So of course, for this intermediate fabric architecture to be useful, we actually have to implement it on top of the FPGA. Um, for this presentation, I'm only going to focus on the soft resource implementation. So first, let's just consider how to implement a virtual routing track. So the bottom left part of the slide, I've kind of zoomed in on an individual track and I show all of its possible connections. And you know, in this case here, it can connect to two switch boxes on each side and a computational unit to the north and a computational unit to the south. Uh, so there's basically four possible sources of this, uh, this routing track. So the way we would go about implementing this with soft resources, or in other words, the RTL implementation for this track, we would basically have to convert this virtual representation into an RTL representation. And the way, the most straightforward way of doing this, or at least the, you know, the initial way of doing this is to find the total number of sources of the track. As I mentioned, there's four sources, there's two CUs and two switch boxes, and then simply add a MUX that selects between these sources. And then the output of the MUX represents kind of the sync of the routing track and is connected to every possible destination of the virtual track. And then there's also several configuration bits which correspond to the select for the MUX. And these bits would get determined when you create the IF bit file. There would basically be several bits in the bit file that you know, specify which source to use for every track in the device. As you could probably guess, these muxes end up being the largest source of overhead in the intermediate fabric because typically a fabric has numerous tracks. So if you have a fabric with 10,000 routing tracks, you have 10,000 of these muxes in the RTL implementation. Fortunately, there's a lot of optimization we can do to reduce these muxes. I'm not gonna go into the details in this talk, but it's covered in some of our papers. Switch boxes are implemented in a similar way as tracks. Basically, inside the switch box, using a soft implementation, there is essentially a MUX for every possible connection between routing tracks. And because the switch box and the entire IF can be specialized to the requirements of an application or to a set of applications, the switch box can basically use any topology you want. Um, another feature that seems a little strange because it's not common in FPGAs is that there are optional registers on all of the outputs from the switch box. And the reason this is an option is that, first of all, if you're using a soft implementation or soft resources for the fabric, there's going to be a large number of combinational loops. And so when you try to synthesize this for the actual FPGA, you're going to get some huge number of warnings. So simply by introducing this register, it breaks those combinational loops. The other more important reason why it's used, or why the registers are used, is that it minimizes delays across all these muxes. So if we have a mux associated with each track and a mux associated with each switch box, a signal could pass through a large number of muxes before reaching its destination, in which case that's a very long propagation delay. By adding in registers, you're essentially pipelining the interconnect, which can allow for much higher clock frequencies.
The disadvantage to pipelining the interconnect is that typically pipelined routing resources can require complicated routing algorithms to ensure that the different routing paths have the same delays and the same number of hops. This is a problem we would like to avoid for intermediate fabrics because we want very fast placement and routing. We unfortunately can't get around this problem in general, but what we can do is work around it for pipeline circuits. So what we can do is implement pipelined portions of a circuit on this pipelined interconnect, and then instead of using complicated routing algorithms, we can use what we call realignment registers to account for the different delays on different routing paths. So the way this works is that we place re realignment registers on the inputs to every computational unit, and these realignment registers are basically variable shift registers that can shift up to some very large amount. So if one input arrives after eight cycles and another input arrives after four cycles, we can delay that second input by four cycles so that they are aligned. And by doing this, we can now use traditional placement and routing algorithms. We don't have, to, the algorithm itself doesn't have to be aware of the routing delays. And the reason this works is because these are pipeline circuits, the realignment registers are effectively just adding more pipelining stages to the existing circuit. So really quick, I wanna give you some strategies for optimizing the area of an intermediate fabric. If you want more details, they're covered in the papers, but one strategy I already mentioned was the use of hard resources to potentially eliminate all of the muxes associated with the virtual tracks and the virtual switch boxes, which corresponds to over 90% of the resource utilization in a soft fabric. Unfortunately, hard resources had several disadvantages, so another potential effective optimization approach is fabric specialization. So the reason that specialization is so effective for an intermediate fabric is that creating a new fabric is basically free. The only cost that's involved is the time it takes to perform a single FPGA place and route to implement that fabric. So unlike a physical device where you need to make very careful decisions so that your device can you know, effectively support a wide range of applications, with intermediate fabrics, you can specialize the fabric to a set of applications or even an individual application so that the fabric only has the resources required by those applications. And by doing so, you can reduce a lot of the area requirements that would be associated with a more general purpose device. So there's no limit on the type of specialization that can be done. In fact, you can create a fabric with you know, whatever you want in it. Uh, but some global strategies for specialization are varying the number of computational units, the types of computational units, the track density, or in other words, the number of routing tracks per channel. You can vary connection box flexibility. You can vary the topology of switch boxes. You can add various numbers of lawn tracks, all based on the requirements of the targeted applications. Likewise, there's a number of local specialization strategies we can apply. Uh, one is called wide channels, which, you know, as opposed to varying track density uniformly across an entire fabric, wide channels will increase just an individual row or an individual column. And the motivation here is that you may have a net list that has high routing requirements, but only in a certain region. Um, so it makes sense then not to increase the routing resources across the entire fabric. Another approach is what we call jump tracks. A jump track is basically a long track that's not confined to a single channel. And this works really well for individual applications because what you can do is add a jump track for every net in the net list, which gives every single routing connection a one hop delay. So now I'd like to go over a, an image processing case study of a particular intermediate fabric that is specialized for what are called sliding window applications. So in this case study, we basically manually created an intermediate fabric that has resources common to these sliding window applications. Uh, specifically, the, the overall intermediate fabric architecture is shown at the top of the slide. It has a specialized controller and a data path. Pretty much everything I've talked about up to this point really just focused on the data path, but of course you can have a fabric that's specialized for anything you want. 
So here we have a basic controller. We also have um, memories and memory controllers um, and address generators and something called a window generator built into the fabric itself. What this window generator does is basically reads in a stream of data from memory and assembles windows that are needed uh, by the data path in every cycle. And then at the bottom of the slide, it kind of zooms in to the data path. So this is a pipeline data path fabric using the type of interconnect I described on the previous slides. Uh, basically, it has 64 multipliers, 64 subtractors um, with an optional absolute value output. It has 63 adders, various delays that could delay up to 9,000 cycles. It has a square, a square root resource. It has 128 inputs and an output that is not shown. And all operations and all track widths for this fabric were 16-bit because the operations were 16-bit fixed point. And in addition, we also created a similar fabric but using 32-bit floating point operations and 32-bit tracks. To save time, I won't go over the experimental setup in detail, but if you're interested, you can pause the video and read this. Basically what we did is we evaluated three different applications, um, both on an intermediate fabric and directly implemented on the FPGA in order to compare the area, to compare the performance, and to compare the placement and routing times. So here are the experimental results. Uh, the first thing to notice is that on average, the intermediate fabrics were able to do placement and routing 700 times faster than the Cordis tools for the Altera FPGA. So the average time was 2.7 seconds compared to over 18 minutes on, the, on Cordis. The average performance overhead was only about 7%. So performance is not as big of a deal when using an intermediate fabric as area. You may notice that the clock overhead was larger. The average clock overhead was 17%. The reason the performance overhead was less was that not everything was based off of the clock. For example, these examples had PCI Express transfers which were independent of the FPGA clock. And so the actual performance overhead was less than the clock overhead. Um, the actual speed up compared to software implementations of these examples um, ranged from 8.3x on the intermediate fabric to 8.8 on the FPGA, so not a big difference. The area utilization was significantly different. So as you can see on the right-hand side of the table, uh, basically the intermediate fabric used anywhere from 2.2x to 4.4x more lookup tables than the circuits implemented directly on the FPGA. However, there are several important things to remember about this. First of all, this intermediate fabric, the area results are somewhat pessimistic because we implemented this fabric only using soft resources. So basically, every track had a MUX, every switch box output had a MUX. So there's a huge number of MUXs that don't necessarily have to be there. So this is kind of a worst case area utilization for the intermediate fabric. Another important thing to remember is that an intermediate fabric is a fabric. It's not just a specific circuit. It can implement numerous circuits. And when you combine that with the fact that these fabrics can do very fast partial reconfiguration, taking either 28 cycles or 72 cycles, depending on the specific fabric you're looking at, you can switch between different applications or different circuits very quickly. So if you have a situation where you might need to implement, you know, three to four of these circuits, um, in the same design, but not have them run simultaneously, the intermediate fabric could actually save area compared to the FPGA design by exploiting this very fast partial reconfiguration. So in other words, the extra area required by the intermediate fabric isn't necessarily area overhead because it can be used for different purposes. So in conclusion, FPGAs have been widely shown to have significant performance and energy advantages for important applications. However, they're not widely used due to low productivity compared to other devices. And as I mentioned earlier, there's two large bottlenecks that we were addressing in this paper. One was long compile times, commonly requiring hours or days. And two was a lack of application portability across devices that limits design reuse.
So the solution to these problems was intermediate fabrics, which are basically virtual reconfigurable architectures implemented on top of FPGAs. And one thing that intermediate fabrics do is they match the granularity of the resources to the operations in the application, and by doing so can provide very fast compilation through very fast placement and routing. Intermediate fabrics also provide a common architecture target regardless of the underlying FPGA, which enables application portability across all of those potential underlying FPGAs. Uh, in this presentation, I showed some preliminary results where intermediate fabrics were able to achieve a 700x placement and routing speedup compared to commercial tools and had a pessimistic 2.2x to 4.8x area penalty with a much less significant 7% performance penalty. And the main research challenge with intermediate fabrics is trying to minimize overhead, which has been the focus of current work and will continue to be the focus of future work. Basically, one strategy or the main strategy that we're, that we're approaching is trying to reduce the number of MUXs required by the virtual routing resources. And we're doing this in several ways. One is by creating novel interconnects that you know, don't follow this traditional island style layout because this is a virtual device and because it can be specialized to individual applications, we can use completely different interconnects than would ever be considered by a physical device. We haven't published the work on novel interconnects yet, but the preliminary results show that the area requirements are reduced by 50% compared to what I showed in this presentation. And we have plans for additional work that we estimate will reduce that by another 50%. So what was presented here is likely highly pessimistic. Um, an additional approach that we haven't evaluated yet is this idea of hard resources, where you basically directly map the virtual resources onto physical resources and avoid these muxes altogether. So thank you for your time. If you're looking for more information, I'd recommend going to my website as shown here. You'll find publications on different parts of intermediate fabrics, and you can feel free to send me an email if you have any questions.